So, um, hello to everybody. I'm Gary Hemming. I'm uh, a software engineer at the European Gravitational Observatory, uh, a member of the Virgo Collaboration, and I'm also the technical manager of the Reinforce uh, project. And we have a few presentations today related to Reinforce and, and also uh, to, to, to other, other areas. Um, I'm not going to take up any time uh, because we have a lot of presentations to get through and I want to leave plenty of time for, for questions and for, uh, for our, our discussion section at the, uh, after the presentations. So uh, without further ado, I will pass over to Francesco Di Renzo from the University of Pisa, who will uh, give us a, a presentation on the, the Gwich Hunters uh, demonstrator project and uh, developed on Zuniver Zooniverse within uh, within the Reinforce project. So Francesco, if you're ready, over to you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, no problem. Perfect. And uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. Hopefully. Oh, great. So uh, I'm happy to be here presenting you this uh, Gwich Hunters demonstrator. I'm Francesco. I'm a postdoc at the University of Pisa. And uh, uh, this demonstrator has been developed within the uh, work pack three of Rainforce. I'm introducing today the goals, the, 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 the aim of this project, and also show you some examples on what ca you can find on the uh, Zuniverse web platform. So I can change the screen. Okay, great. Uh, do you see slide number two by chance? Yes. Okay, perfect. So the goal of this project is twofold. On one hand, we want to uh, promote and deliver uh, a deeper knowledge of the science that we do at gravitational waves detector, like Virgo near Pisa in Italy, to a broad community of citizen scientists. And uh, we want to do that uh, uh, by means of uh, some uh, means of communication that are enjoyable by the vastest audience possible. In, uh, and for example, we want to make these means as inclusive as possible and also uh, enjoyable by people of all ages and uh, people for, with, uh, for example, uh, sight disabilities, etc. And uh, on the other end, we want to make the citizens active contributors in gravitational wave research and together develop some uh, new knowledges about the working principle of the detectors and develop also new technologies, for example, involving artificial intelligence. I will come up to this uh, later. So how can we do that? Firstly, as you can imagine, the data produced by gravitational wave detectors is kind of complicated but we can make them enjoyable by everyone, transforming it into some convenient form. For example, uh, I like the uh, relevant feature of features of this data and represent it into images, as you can see on the left-hand side part of this, uh, of this slide. Uh, this is a time frequency map of the energy distribution of a particular signal, which is the First detection event, GW150914, corresponding to a coalescence of two, by two black holes. This map, this image in shades of red, clearly highlights a, a specific feature, a C-shaped uh, lighter region, which represents how the uh, energy of the signal evolved, as I said, with time and frequency. As you can imagine, concept like frequency, energy can be a little bit troublesome for, uh, for example, young kids or for my grandparents. So in addition to these uh, red images, we decided to convert them to uh, another, another kind of images. And we did this uh, making uh, the correspondence every frequency interval of this image to the corresponding piano note, white piano note of a piano keyboard which are the C major scale of occidental music. And also we have associated to the energy of this, uh, the signal in red, the, the strength, that means how you press, you, you can press the corresponding piano, piano key. And this turns out to be 
a nice piece of piano music, which is, as I said, an additional way to represent this image and the, the data itself. So uh, the idea was to deliver the, the data that we are recording with our detectors in terms, in terms of images and sounds. What about sound will be, uh, I guess, uh, said about by, by Beatrice in, in, in the next talk. Okay, next, uh, gravitational wave detectors, unfortunately, not only measure gravitational data from uh, uh, astrophysical sources like uh, the binary black holes that I've mentioned before, you can see indeed in the image on the left, uh, another kind of uh, feature of white feature. This is called the glitch and its origin is uh, from some uh, instrumental, instrumental malfunctioning. So what we ask uh, citizens to do is firstly to uh, tell apart, to distinguish these glitch features, which are terrestrial in origin from what I showed you before, that is this, this feature here, which is astrophysical from two stars. This is one thing we want to, to ask um, citizens to do. The other thing is to um, relate this, uh, uh, the signal here with other signals recorded by gravitational wave detectors. This is uh, both a way to uh, describe in depth the working principle of our detectors, presenting to the citizens a large number of signals recorded by these detectors. Signals, for example, corresponding to the uh, functioning of various subparts of the detector and also of its environment. And uh, also in, in exchange, we ask them to find similarity between, uh, between the signals recorded by the main uh, Virgo channel, the one aimed at detecting gravitational waves, and the one uh, and the other channels aimed at uh, measuring the status of the environment. This is very important in understanding the, the origin of these noise disturbances, which are called glitches. This is what we will propose on the uh, Witch Hunters uh, with the Witch Hunters project that you can reach uh, via the uh, Zoo Universe web platform and also on, uh, on the Zoo Universe app, uh, which you can download on your smartphone. It's kind of nice uh, to, to spend some time playing with it as a, as, a, as a video game of some sort. With one of, the, of our goal, goals was to make all of this thing, all the science that we do, not only interesting, but also kind of uh, entertaining. That is, people are motivated to spend time learning about gravitational waves and contributing to gravitational waves research. So at this point, I would invite you at the end of this workshop to try, to try yourself this uh, Gui Chantas demonstrator. Uh, but in, yeah, in the next uh, three slides, I will very briefly show you uh, some example of tasks that we're asked to do. For example, one task is to recognize the shape of uh, these glitches among a certain set of, uh, of labels of classes that we identified, because we think that similar classes have a similar origin. This is one task. The other task is to recognize the portion of the various images where we see glitches, we see excess of, uh, of energy, in that case, excess of noise. And you can do this with this nice uh, rectangle tool. Lastly, as I mentioned, we, we can play with uh, auxiliary channels, auxiliary data channels, in order to find correlation and uh, discover the, the origin of uh, the, the noise gravitational wave detectors. So, Thank you. Uh, if you have any question right now, or we, you can uh, we can discuss about this project later. Thanks very much, Francesco. So uh, there are no questions currently on on the chat. Um, obviously, feel free to if you, if a question comes to mind to uh, to put that uh, to Francesco as we as we go through the meeting. Sure, um, but. If there aren't any uh, any points to, to raise at the moment, uh, I just note that uh, Stephen has, has provided a, a common document for, for any notes that people wish to, to add uh, available in the chat. 
uh, otherwise, I think we can, I can say thank you to Francesco. Thanks very much. And uh, I'll move on to, to Pascal, who will give us a presentation on the, the Deep Sea Explorers uh, project. Can you not? Okay, good. Can everybody see that? Yep. Good. Okay, so I'd like to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, another work package within Reinforce, which is called uh, Deep Sea Explorers. And we also make use of the Zooniverse uh, framework to allow the citizen science to, uh, to do the physics. Um, it's based around a, uh, a telescope called a kilometer cube neutrino telescope, which may be less familiar to everybody than uh, the CERN accelerator or, um, or the gravitational wave detector. So I just have a couple of slides to introduce what we're doing and then I'll get to the citizen science aspects. Um, so what we're in the process of doing is building a, a giant telescope to do neutrino astronomy uh, neutrinos are special uh, particles uh, that are emitted in the explosions of stars and uh, whenever black holes are, are in the game. Um, so instead of catching the light, we try to catch the neutrinos from these uh, explosions. Uh, neutrinos are neutral, which means they don't get devi deviated by magnetic fields. So that allows us um, travel in straight lines, so we can do the astronomy. The unique property is they're weakly interacting, so they can escape from the densest regions uh, inside stars, so we can see inside stars. And uh, as they're not absorbed, uh, we can essentially see to the end of the universe. But that is also their biggest disadvantage. They're very weakly interacting, so we need absolutely ginormous detectors to have a chance to catch them. Um, okay, so uh, we do that by using big detectors in the deep sea, and this was a, an amusing photograph I found recently, which shows uh, a kind of a diving suit from the 1880s, where you see uh, when this, in those days when they explore in the universe, they used a suit like this, and they had this helmet where they could see and listen to what was happening in the deep sea. We do a similar thing, and this is the new helmet we use, but it, there's nobody inside it, just the electronics. So we use a, a sphere with lots of photo detectors and which can also listen to the sea. So it's a bit like the brain of the diver, but instead of having one diver, we have uh, tens and thousands of these uh, monitoring 3D cameras uh, in the deep sea. So here's a little sketch of what it looks like. So this is of kilometer high kilometers in both directions. And we have many uh, of these spheres which detect the light and are listening uh, to what happens in the sea. Uh, so it's a large infrastructure, very deep, uh, several thousand, well, 2,500 2, meters and 3,000 meters deep in the dark sitting in the sea. Um, so we're in the process of building that. Uh, we already have uh, a dozen of lines now detected, and this just shows a little animation of some neutrinos that we've already caught with this telescope. And you see, uh, you get a flash of light when the neutrino passes by, which is detected by the, the light sensors. Um, so for the Deep Sea Explorers Citizen Science Project, uh, we, we decided to focus not really on the neutrinos themselves, but on the, the backgrounds for detecting the neutrinos, because we have these eyes and ears in the deep sea. We not only catch the light from neutrinos, but we also catch the light from all the bioluminescence organisms in the deep sea, for example, jellyfish, bacteria, etc. And uh, our listening devices can also hear all the whales and all the dolphins around. So uh, we thought it would be fun and, and interesting to uh, explore this part of the, the telescope. And it's where we don't have much effort and where the citizen science could really make a big impact. So the idea is with uh, deep sea explorers that we would kind of classify the bioluminescence signals and the bio 
acoustic signals detected by the telescope within using the Zooniverse approach. Uh, we're in the process of also developing kind of uh, machine learning automatic algorithms to classify the, these signals. So we'd like to compare them with what the citizen science think. And of course it introduces uh, the citizen science into the, uh, the science of detecting neutrinos, astronomy, and the, the kind of the, the biodiversity in the deep sea. The telescope is uh, very new and so these sort of studies have not been done before so it will be really uh, an exploration together. Um, so we've developed uh, within uh, the Zooniverse uh, a kind of interface to allow people to do the, the citizen science. I won't have time to go into that in much detail. Um, but here's a kind of an example of the bioluminescence workflow. So we have the counting rates, uh, how many photons, pieces of light are seen on each of the optical modules as a function of time. So the citizen scientists would be invited to kind of uh, classify how many peaks they see, how intense the peaks are um, as a function of time for, for different periods of the year. Uh, so we would like to understand our kind of optical backgrounds uh, much better. Similarly, uh, for the acoustic signals, as for the um, gravitational waves, we have kind of a, a spectrum which depends on frequency, uh, which will have inside it, hidden inside these frequency uh, maps. So it's kind of frequency versus time. Uh, there will be hidden the signals from the dolphins and the whales. So here you see an example where there's a lot of clicks happening. So the, the citizen scientists will be invited to kind of classify the different acoustic signals. And then we'll compare that with our, our automatic algorithms to see uh, how they're working and how we can improve uh, our algorithms. And of course, these signals give a lot of information on the kind of population and behavior of whales and dolphins and around the detector. Okay, well, that's basically just a, a very quick introduction. So we, uh, we hope by understanding better our optical and noise backgrounds, we actually improve uh, what we can do in the detection of neutrinos. But not only that, we will also understand uh, much, much better the kind of the deep sea uh, in a very kind of unexplored, uh, phase space uh, with the optical signals, bioluminescent signals and bioacoustic signals. The project uh, will be coming online uh, very soon. So we hope uh, you will join us and uh, together we will try and uh, illuminate uh, what's happening in the deep sea. Thank you. Thanks, Pascal. So again, we have uh, no questions for you at the moment. Um, please, if you do have any questions, you can either add them to the chat or uh, ask them again once we get to the end of the presentation session. Um, so, uh, in that case, I, I would uh, I would suggest we move uh, directly on to uh, Stilian Stilianos presentation <laughs> uh, on uh, new particle search at CERN. Over to you, Stelios. Hello. Uh, can you see the slide? Yeah, no problem. Okay. So uh, I'm going to describe to you uh, work packet five of Reinforce, which is called New Particle Search at CERN. So in our demonstrator, uh, which is also based a lot on Zooniverse, uh, we invite citizens to become scientists of CERN and uh, work on the search of new physics with the Large Hadron Collider. Here's an an image of the LHC. You can see that it's located 100 meters uh, below the surface of the Earth. And it has two 27 kilometer tubes where proton beams are accelerated uh, close to the speed of light. Uh, and, uh, now, there are four points along the LHC circumference where the tubes intersect and the beams collide. You can see them below the arrow. Um, Atlas 
is one of the detectors that uh, operates at the LHC. And it's located exactly at one of the uh, collision points. You can see it here. It's like a huge uh, cylinder. The beams are coming from the left and from the right side, and they collide exactly at the center. From those collisions, we get different sorts of particles. So we have first stable particles, the, those that don't stop until we force them to stop. And these are the particles that Atlas is de uh, designed to detect uh, directly. You can see the slice of the cylinder below that shows the different layers of, the, of Atlas. Each one serves a different purpose, but they all provide us the necessary information to identify uh, all kinds of particles and, uh, and uh, measure their kinematic properties. So we have the inner detector or the tracker close to the collision point that uh, collects traces of charged particles that we can use to reconstruct their tracks. Then we have uh, the calorimeters. Uh, the, the brown one is electromagnetic calorimeter, and then we have the hadronic calorimeter that stop particles so that we can measure their energy. And uh, the outer layer is the immune spectrometer that uh, uh, detects muons since they are the only charged particles that can penetrate the entire detector. Uh, of course, we also have unstable particles that decay very quickly, most of them before reaching any uh, detector layer. So we can infer their presence uh, indirectly by combining the information that we get from uh, the stable particle products of their decays. Now, other than those, there are there is a uh, special category of particles that is, uh, has not been discovered yet, but uh, is expected by um, certain supersymmetry theoretical models, which are called long-lived particles. These are also unstable particles, but with unusually long lifetimes. So they are expected to, to travel a significant distance inside the detector before decaying. And since their discovery, a discovery of such particle uh, would uh, immediately signify the presence of new physics. Uh, such a discovery could be even greater than the discovery of the Higgs boson itself. So these particles are the main subject of research in this demonstrator. Oh, below you can see a schematic of a long-lived particle that's produced from the collision of two protons, and it travels some distance before decaying to a uh, known uh, particles, uh, namely a muon and, uh, and a quark. Uh, so our goal, based on this uh, theoretical background, is to exploit the vast amount of ATLAS uh, real and simulated data in order to provide an exciting and educating experience to citizens, but also in a way so that we can uh, measure how well they can do in certain tasks in certain tasks that are usually carried out by machines. So the project, uh, the whole demonstrator is divided into three stages. First, um, the first two stages are, are based on simulated data. In the first, citizens are going to look for displaced vertices. They're going to learn how to um, identify them in the Atlas inner detector. On stage two, they are going to uh, understand um, how to identify particles uh, visually, also using simulated data. And in the third stage, they're going to use what they learned in order to browse a substantial amount of real data and try to find things of interest. I'd like to point out, of course, that simulated data are equally important to real data in this case, because these are the data that we use uh, in the real life to prepare our algorithms and train them, but also to evaluate them. So the same thing uh, we intend to do with the citizens, to train them, but also evaluate how well they can do when they uh, encounter the real data. So 
I think I have some time left, so I'm going just to give you a glimpse of the uh, demonstrator of his own Zooniverse. Uh, but before that, I, I'm, I want to tell you that the platform will become available to the public in the next months. And for additional information and news, you can visit the uh, Reinforce webpage. So, uh, can you see the webpage now that is switched? Yeah, no problem. Okay. Uh, also, can you tell me how much time I got? <laughs> Sorry. You have about uh, two or three minutes. Good. So. Okay. So, this is, uh, thank you. This is uh, our home page on uh, on Zooniverse. You can see a welcome message and various links that provide information about the physics uh, of the project and the Atlas, uh, uh, the Atlas detector, etc. And below, and here you see the uh, four buttons that link to the three stages of uh, the demonstrator. So we have stage one that I described, stage two, and stage three that is uh, split in two parts. So I have time to uh, give you an example from stage one. So if I click here, yes. This is the uh, um, visual detection of displaced vertices. So here we are presented with two projections of the Atlas inner detector, the tracker. So we see different reconstructed tracks. And the goal here is to use our mouse pointer to uh, identify the location um, of a displaced vertex that has some dif uh, distance from the center of the detector. In this case, this is a very easy case, luckily. Um, I see that this point here is, could be the common origin of these tracks. And I do the same thing on the other side, on the longitudinal projection. So I put my points, and then I click Done. And I get some feedback. It tells me that, OK, I was able to find both points. OK, and I proceed. To the next event. So ah, this is a more difficult case. I'll do this also very quickly. So here I found one and I missed one. So uh, of course, for every stage, there are there is a lot of information, uh, concise tutorials, and more detailed um, help sections that users can uh, follow. Um, uh, to help them with the with its uh, its exercise. So I'd like to show you all of the stages now because we have completed them, but unfortunately I don't have time. So um, um, I'll just uh, stop here and tell you that um, I expect that you will all be able to uh, test our demonstrator soon and that it will be able to gather, according to Zooniverse, uh, several thousand of citizen scientists that uh, will try, try it out and uh, tell us if uh, citizens can perform better than the machines. So, thank you. Thanks very much, Stelios. Uh, we have a question for you from the okay. chat uh, from uh, Carolina Minch. Apologies if I mispronounced your name, Carolina. <laughs> um, how long did it take to plan and prepare this study and what took the most time? Uh, I think I started on December 2019 when Zooniverse started. So it's a... Uh, when reinforce started yeah when, when uh, yes i'm sorry when reinforce started so it's uh, close to getting close to two years and the most difficult part well there was there were a lot of not difficult but uh, parts that required time to gather uh, uh, data from atlas to get approval from atlas to them to to show the data to to design each stage. So they were all equally easy and equally difficult, I could say. Thanks, Stelios. 
So uh, thanks very much for answering that and thanks for the presentation. Um, I'll ask you to stop sharing your screen. Thank you. Thank you. And we can move on to the next presentation, which will be given by Theodore Avgitas from CNRS uh, on uh, cosmic muon images. Over, over to you, Theodore. Yes, hello. Uh, let me share my screen. Now I'm sharing my screen. Do you see anything? Yeah. Now? Yeah, we see uh, your kind of all of your slide notes as well. But now you see it properly. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So, um, okay, we are doing muon tomography. And um, we are also uh, using the this universe uh, demonstrator in order to, to get some help from people to tell us inside our detectors uh, if they see what patterns they see in what we will consider to be background. So, okay, it doesn't make any sense now because I haven't shown anything, but okay. So, what is muon tomography? Muon tomography is a way to look inside large uh, uh, massive bodies like mountains, volcanoes, and um, buildings uh, by using uh, particles that come from the sky and they are coming from the sky all the time. And it is like uh, the, the X-ray that we do when we go to, to the hospital. So in the X-rays, you have uh, the, the photons coming from one part and you have another uh, a photographic plate behind the body. And you manage to see the bones because uh, the bones block photons and the other soft tissue let it pass through. So in a similar manner, muons pass uh, through, through objects and uh, you can see what is the density uh, distribution inside the inside these uh, massive uh, massive bodies, and this has a, a very large uh, applications, very wide applications. It goes from the the geo, geophysics, uh, from volcanology, geology. Uh, you can see inside the volcanoes, understand how the 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 pathways of the of the water and the the magma are uh, are forming. You can uh, see it in uh, okay. Uh, you can see it also live how they change and uh, but okay. And this is very good because you are far away from the object and uh, you are not in that much uh, danger. Uh, the, there is also the the archaeology part uh, where you can look inside. Uh, buried monuments or there was this um, a mission in uh, Giza where they where, where they show that there is a hidden chamber in the the big pyramid and there are also other uh, aspects where you have uh, for instance in the in the metro of Paris uh, you have in the tunnel boring machine a uh, immune detector and you can see in front of the of the tunnel boring machine what is the distribution of, uh, of, the, of the soil and if there are instabilities that would probably cause the, the machine to stop because they weren't prepared for this, uh, for this scenario. And uh, okay, the, the principle is a bit simple. As I told you, you have a, a muon that passes an object. Uh, you know, uh, what is the, the distance between the points that it enters and it exits. You find what is the energy. And uh, in this manner, you, you understand what is the, the mass that uh, these muons had to, to, pa to, to pass through. And because you know also what it would be expected as a number of muons if there was no object in front, you can infer what is the, the density of the, of, the, of the object. So this is something that we did in Greece in 2018, where we had a buried uh, tumulus. It is in this hill uh, underneath. And inside this, uh, this trailer is our detector. And uh, the, the image uh, down, down left is the top, topographic map of, of the site. So we know exactly from one point to the other, what is the distance? And if we do all these uh, calculations, 
we get a, a density profile for the for the for the monument. Uh, in the borders, is, it is not very good because uh, the monument is small and we have some effects that we cannot uh, compensate for. But uh, the overall uh, density in uh, in the bottom part, at least where we where we should expect some uh, increased density, was uh, was pretty good. That that's pretty good, not uh, good enough. So this is the, the detector, it's three planes. It detects uh, particles uh, with uh, these uh, three planes and uh, you can reconstruct the, the path of uh, the particle inside the, the detector. Uh, in order to, to do this, you use a scintillator, the, the, the particle passes, it produces a photon or many photons. You collect these photons, you go to a PMT, and uh, you put all these strips together, you can monitor the, the one direction. Then you put them in different places perpendicularly and uh, one plane monitors X uh, direction, the other one, the Y direction. And in this manner, you have a track, you have a, a straight line. Uh, and uh, this is the, the technique. Now the, the problem is that uh, uh, when you, when you have a shower, so you, you can see that uh, the, there is a primary particle that ca comes from outer space and then it produces all these particles, uh, you are mostly interested in the gray lines. And uh, it is a sea of, of many things that you don't want to, 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 to detect, but you detect, unfortunately. Moreover, because you look at very low angles, you have uh, less muons uh, the, the, the further down you go. And uh, okay, this is a bit of a, of a mess. We, we figure out uh, how to resolve the mess, but, uh, but in the end, you always have uh, this background, uh, this background that uh, it is registered by your, uh, by your detector. And this is what we want to do. We want to, to put people in the, in the universe platform, explain them all these things, uh, and uh, provide them. Uh, you see, it is the about section that uh, you tell people what you are doing, who is doing it. Uh, we go through all these information that I said, I, I discussed uh, very briefly. You have the frequently asked questions where whatever things are come up many times, you, you have to address them properly. And uh, when we have to go to, to the classification, because I, I we have to say what is this classification, you have two, two workflows. One that is introductory, which has simple cases that people would address very fast, and the more advanced. Uh, categorization where they have to do a bit of a, they have to, to understand a bit better and to do the, and solve the problem. So for this thing, we used not what we considered a signal, but what we considered that uh, it was not nuanced, but we will see in the end what, what is going to, to happen. So the idea is to have a heuristic approach where they will tell us uh, what they see and uh, what they believe it is according to our, uh, to our guidelines. And we are going to train a neural network uh, to, to see how it compares with our current, uh, with our current um, way of reconstructing and identifying the signal and background. And we are going also to, to have, uh, the, this thing is going to help us to, to see how we will need to manipulate our simulation of, uh, of the cosmic ray showers to, to retrieve results close to what they are going to, to provide us from, from this work. So this is a bit okay. Uh, I thought that I would have time to, to show also the, the universe uh, demonstrator, but I don't think I have time. I, I think I'm out of time. I, I don't know. Um, 
Okay, thanks, David. Uh, I've provided the link to the, the project. Yes, I'm sorry. I, I thought that was okay. Yes, uh, I'm no sorry. No problem. Time flies when you're having fun, Theodore. Thanks very much for that. There was there was one question in the chat from uh, from Irena, which was a, a, a more general uh, question uh, in terms of approaches to crediting citizen scientists. What what the plans are for credit for crediting citizen scientists when there are new discoveries? Now I don't know whether you've already given much thought to that part uh, of the uh, of the project, Theodore. Uh, I. What, what we, how we are going to credit these people. We are going to provide, uh, we are going to say, of course, that uh, this new information comes from people that work in the universe. Uh, okay, I don't, I didn't mention that, but uh, my goal and uh, we hope that people are going to come to us and the, or not only use uh, the Zooniverse platform to do the, the classifications, but come uh, and to take the data and to try to find the uh, new reconstruction algorithms, try their own uh, neural networks or machine learning algorithms in the, in the data. We are making them available. So uh, each person is going to be credited uh, according to his job. If someone does something uh, pretty cool and uh, we publish based on his job, he is going to the publication the first name. I mean, we, we, we credit, we credit everyone. I'll just add to that as well, Irene, I think uh, from a, the perspective of, of all of the demonstrators, from the perspective of oh, okay. in general, um, obviously the vast uh, bulk of the work in the first half of the project has been concentrated upon getting these projects up and running. And then the second half of the project moves into the into the engagement of people. And we're, we've already had uh, engagement activities and so on, but uh, um, a lot of that is, is is starting to kick into gear now. Um, certainly, it's an element that's being considered, and we've discussed many times. I, I wouldn't say that we have a concrete plan uh, in terms of, of uh, how we are how we will credit people, but we have discussed various different options uh, within the team. Uh, uh, and we're, we're very interested in, in sort of in, in engaging with our with our uh, with our group of, of people who are interested and and uh, uh, and bringing them into the into the science uh, within the, the different uh, different projects. Thanks very much for that, Theodore. Um, I, I will now pass the the baton on to, to Beatrice Garcia from Conicef in Argentina. And uh, Beatrice will give us a nice presentation on the on the, the sonification aspect of the, of the project. Over to you, Beatrice. Perfect. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, no problem. Okay. Let's uh, present. Uh, so, oh, sorry. Uh, okay. I hope you are seeing the first slide. It's about the working group or working package seven is about sonification and the real purpose is increasing the sense is increasing inclusion as you know uh, almost uh, or the most part of the knowledge of the cosmos uh, of the cosmos uh, arrive uh, outside the visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum and as you realize uh, Rainforce has the purpose to demonstrate that there are more messengers from the sky and um, we live in this time of the astrophysics multi wavelength and multi messenger and um, as part of this uh, big project, uh, which included uh, the engagement of the citizens in different uh, aspects of the first line science. Uh, the idea is to explore the inclusion and the inclusion is uh, providing new uh, tools. Uh, one of these is the sonification and the idea is to uh, sonorize the data for uh, all the demonstrators that you uh, know right now. And um, in this sense, give visibility to a multimodal proposal to access the data through different uh, resources and tools, uh, assuring the communication with the public. In this sense, uh, uh, part of the answer of how to engage, how to give credits to the public, uh, uh, the citizens, 
is uh, to ask the citizens uh, be part of our development. This um, approach, the Sonification platform, uh, which is also connected uh, with training courses, uh, proposes creation, it's just ready, of a tool, uh, a user centered design software to produce audiovisual outputs from the data. Uh, the, to do this, we integrate a lot of disciplines, but uh, we are not just astronomers or physicists. We are also, our group is integrated by uh, software specialists, psychologists, neurobiologists, uh, biologists. It means we need to integrate people to produce a user center uh, tool. And uh, also we integrate uh, not only people who um, sighted persons, but also blind. Uh, to access all the problems to transform the data, not only in a, an image. The other aspect, important aspect of the inclusion is uh, to create a platform for artistic intervention. It means not only science, also the connection, the interconnection, the cross reflection between artists and scientists. Uh, about the user center design software, uh, which uh, is called Sono Uno, we have just really the tool. Uh, we have two, two platforms, the, the uh, general uh, desktop uh, software. You can download it and you can install it in your, in your laptop. But also we are developing a web interface. Uh, the idea is to have a full set of um, resources like uh, the manuals and the instructives uh, of use, the, the tutorials, uh, galleries connected with the, with the um, demonstrators, um, ways to install because the installation of the desktop uh, version is not, uh, is not trivial, but also permit the use of the, of the website, which is a, a complete interface uh, you can use uh, with our own data, the rainforest data, and for that there, there, there are a, a list or there is a list of a different uh, set of data and also simple mathematical functions to training the people, uh, but also the platform permits the use of uh, um, the user data. It means it's a full resource, it's a tool, a general tool for everyone accessible through Sono Uno platform. The idea is to have at the same uh, screen, not only the image on, or the plot to solarize, but also all the um, different uh, sets to decide about sound, because as the eyes, they are not ear identical. So the people needs to choose what is the best way to sonorize the data? And after to know about the demonstrators, about the first line science projects, the messengers that we are trying to study, after that, give the possibility to continue with the analysis and the study of the data. In this sense, at the website, you have a full set of, uh, of different options, even the plot, the data, the plot and the, the sound to train your ear and your eyes also. And uh, uh, you can save your own action on the data, on the plot and on the sound. It means you can save all that you do with the data, marks, plots, sound and use it again in future studies. About this, the one of the important things uh, to, to maintain, engage the citizens uh, is the or are the training courses. Uh, we need to simulate some data to train the people in th this new approach to the analysis. Remember that data sonification enhances the data analysis and is an addition to the visualization, visualization for the people who can see. But for the blind people, is the only way to access the data and to analyze the data. It means to make science. 
to do the, the training courses, we need more tools and resources from different um, different uh, developments like the Psycho Toolbox, the iLink. It means this is a, a full set of uh, different ideas to train the citizen scientists in this kind of approach. We have very successful stories. One of these is uh, this uh, impressive uh, exhibition the, here in the universe in a spider, in a spider web. And uh, as you can see, the planet was the scenario. It was performed a couple of years ago. And the idea was sunrise the spider web at the spider net and try to um, uh, detect your own net, your own spider's web at, at home and share this with the people and sonorize the different kinds of uh, spider webs. The other successful story was connected with a total eclipse in 2018 and 2020 in South America, where we use different kinds of tools, like, for example, the light sound is a development made by Harvard University. We have very good friends there. We use that to sonorize the light of the sun uh, along the eclipse uh, at the time when the moon uh, cover the surface of the sun, we have the data, we have the light, we have the sound of the full process, the full event. We have the data in the, in the laptop and we can use this data to resonarize the eclipse using um, Sono Uno. This is the full screen for Sono Uno analysis. You have the clips that each one of these lines are people crossing in front of the detector. And the, 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 oh, the, the, the second line was the eclipse itself. Oops, sorry. No, oops, sorry, sorry. It means you can use the data in many ways and you can summarize the data, you can follow producing new science and discover new features in the data. The other highlight for, uh, for Reinforce uh, in a sense of uh, the inclusion is a platform to put all together big ideas in science. It's a platform to monitor concentration on a specific problems and mechanism of, of attention. And in this sense, we will uh, have uh, training courses, workshops, special activities, our science connection. Here, um, a group of uh, blind students making orbits around the sound. And here, the sound of the light in different positions when they um, move in, into the orbit. Which are the learning lessons of this activity? Well, the first one is that we need to evaluate all the resources, all the ideas, and, re and revise these ideas and the content of the, the tools and the resources um, through the feedback with the users. This is one of the big learning lessons. The other is just use resources and techniques tested. Include blind and deaf astronomers as advisors and study all the time and each step the impact, not only in the citizens, very interested one, but also in different audiences, because there is a, um, a, a, a great um, aspect connected with the culture. We need to evaluate in different countries and with different languages. For the future, we believe that would be good to adopt this technique to make science, not only education and outreach, use the sonorization to make big discoveries. And in this uh, sense, we need to suggest the nations to carry out assessment in a user center uh, quality devices or tools. Uh, on the other side, um, try to report how to evaluate and develop the prototypes on databases because the user center design is the most important thing in this kind of approach. Recognize the multisensorial exploration as a valid study of the data, not only the visual one, and stimulate the agencies to fund this kind of approach to the, to the science in education, in outreach, but also in research. 
increase the abilities to identify signatures in the information will be connected with the sonification. There, are, there will be more people which can be part of the discovers if we give new resources. And um, we are sure that we will increment, increase the number of scientific discoveries. The open science must accept him different exploration styles, more perspective, different experiences. And this is my la last uh, slide. As you can see, we can talk about equality or equity, but uh, when we detect the cause of the inequity, we need to eliminate to remove the systemic barriers. And this is inclusion. And that's all. I invite you to, to see the, the Sonouno platform, uh, which uh, will be released uh, very soon. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Beatrice. Thank you very much indeed for that. Um, we're running quite, quite short, relatively short on time for the, the content that we have left. So I will ask you, I will ask now, uh, Janice, if you're, if you're ready, we'll move straight on to your presentation. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to sort of change the direction of what we've been talking about slightly to introduce you to another project called Cost for Cloud. And uh, uh, one of the citizen observatories um, that are involved in the project, which, are led, um, which is led by the Open University. I'm Janice Ansign. I manage citizen science in the STEM faculty at the OU. And I also lead work package six under the Cost for Cloud project. So what is Cost for Cloud? Cost for Cloud is a European project to boost citizen science technologies. We are working on integrating citizen science in open science in the European open science landscape, mainly working through the EOSC, EOSC. Uh, we're providing user-centered and innovative services to citizen observatories. We're focusing on facilitating training, engagement, networking, and knowledge management across organizations, people, and initiatives working on citizen observatories. And we're also contributing to the growth and sustainability of the citizen, science, citizen observatories themselves. The project involves a range of partners, as you can see them below here, including the Open University, where I'm based. So um, I think one of the first things we probably need to, to quickly um, identify is, what's a citizen observatory? A CO, as we like to call it, shortened version, is a community-based monitoring and information system. It's usually focused on environmental or biodiversity areas, but the range of things are growing, as you can see from different projects that have been presented today. It's usually embedded in portable or mobile devices. It focuses on boosting citizen engagement and participation and on improving the management of natural resources, in particular flora, fauna, et cetera. And it has a collaborative approach, sometimes even a co-created approach, where it, it, support, it supports and builds an online community. So in Cost for Cloud, we're focusing on um, building expertise through the experiences and integration of nine established citizen observatories um, across Europe, some operate globally as well. Alongside, um, around biodiversity, we have Art Portland, which is based in Sweden. We have Natrosfera, which is based in Spain. We have iSpot, which is based um, in the UK, but does um, have observations globally. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about iSpot shortly. And we have PlantNet, which is based in France, but also operates globally. In terms of environmental quality, we have a few focused on water monitoring. We have Freshwater Watch. We have Kudwano. And we also have a few on air monitoring. We have Order Collect, Canario, and Icepex. And you can see more about all of this on the Cost for Cloud website. So 
what it, how do how are we working with citizen observatories and building on that expertise which already exists? iSpot is an open university platform which was developed to focus on identifying and learning about biodiversity. It supports an extensive community to help them of experts and novices to help people, anybody upload a photo and, and get to identify it through the community working together. As I said, it's UK, it's based in the UK, but global. We started, we launched the platform in 2009, so it's been running for 12 years now, just over 12 years, with an overarching aim to lower barriers to ID, I mean, building identification skills, make nature more accessible, help to foster a new, a new generation of naturalists, and focus on biological data recording. We have a whole range of features and, and tools built in, and a key element also is engagement, teaching, and learning, where we integrate specific tools and approaches to facilitate this. So very briefly, I spot you can explore, you can browse observations, you can identify and record. Um, to do this, you have to register and post and use it, and you, uh, post observations, et cetera. You can also give identifications contributing to others and agreements. You can add comments, join forums, discussions. And one and a key thing with iSpot is you can gain reputation points. You can also personalize the system and learn. You can create filters using the projects tool, and you can um, use the identification keys, which are online in iSpot, take quizzes and associated courses. So how does this map across into, into Cost for Cloud? Cost for Cloud is, is facilitating 11 technological services, resources, and tools to support and improve citizen science technologies. These are being co-designed, working with different, the different um, citizens observatories, which I mentioned earlier, key stakeholders and others to, to facilitate a wide ranging type of engagement that, 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 that is integrated and utilized by users. The service will also help to improve interoperability, networking, data quality and secure management of, of data within citizen observatories. Is helping to boost things for the future. So here is a whistle stop tour of the 11 services. Um, I won't go into detail here. You can actually look at these on the, web, on, the, on the website. One of the key ones which integrates iSpot is Cost for Bio, which focuses on biodiversity observations. And we're also doing some work now looking at the fast, fast cat resources. We're looking at um, looking at um, integrating um, um, photo, um, video, videos and camera traps of images of, of, of different species and integrating that within us. We're working on those areas of now. But as you can see, there are wide ranges of approaches that will not only benefit the nine observatories involved in Cost for Cloud, but, the, but, but system observatories more widely. And what can you do? We're working through a co-design process. So we're trying to integrate um, people throughout the process. We're co-designing these services so you can join the community and participate. The various links of how you can join in. There's various information on the, on the Cost for Cloud website um, that can facilitate this type of engagement because what we want is something that's co-designed and created by those who are really involved in this area so that it can benefit them to the best, best, best possibility. Um, I'll stop there and um, I can take questions later. There's a little bit more information, um, including a, a free course which we have from the Open University, which focuses on citizen science and global biodiversity. Thank you. That's great. Thanks very much, Janice. There are no questions in the chat at present, but we can always uh, come back to, to them if they appear. Stephen, uh, if you're if you're ready, over to you for the for the next, for the final presentation of the session. Okay. Um, uh, while I remember, Janice, if you could possibly put the links that you put up into the chat, then we can make sure that they're they're all included. Uh, now, let me see if I can share my screen. It's always the hairy moment. So let's share the let's just do it. Share the whole desktop. Why not? What could possibly go wrong? And now I'll show the slideshow. Can I just check that uh, you can hear me and see the slide? Yeah, no problem. Hurrah, brilliant, great. 
that's the worst bit over. <laughs> right, so I'm going to talk about uh, citizen science in the European open science cloud with a particular focus on escape. Now, escape is a research infrastructure cluster uh, bringing together all of these various astronomy and particle physics and astroparticle physics facilities and try to build services and resources for these facilities uh, for the open European Open Science Cloud. And there are a whole wide range of services that are being offered. Um, I just want to show you that the citizen science part is part of this, this wider landscape of services like a virtual observatory and a data lake and science platforms and so on. And uh, while most of what, my, what I'll be talking about is uh, the escape project, I should say that we are trying now to expand our work in citizen science from escape into the wider EOSC future uh, uh, a range of uh, projects, so from life sciences, social sciences, environmental, photon science, neutron science, and so on. Um, so I'm going to kick off with a provocative statement, and I will say that uh, for open science, making data fair, you know, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, making data fair is easy <laughs> compared to making fair data useful, and they've got a um, a salutary story about this. So in my own uh, astrophysics area, there was a, a gamma ray telescope that uh, had made all of its data open and a team looked at this gamma ray telescope's open data and found an, an excess of gamma rays close to the galactic center. And they said that this is where all the dark matter is concentrated in the galaxy halo. So this is dark matter annihilation. And this would be a tremendous result because we know very little about what dark matter is. But the instrument team looked at the same data and came to the opposite conclusion. They were saying that in fact, it is just an instrumental artifact. Now I'm not taking us any particular side in this, but I just want to use this as an example that data have pitfalls and users need training. It's not enough to make your data just fair and open. They're, you need to know a lot more about the context of data, otherwise there are pitfalls. My second provocative statement is that the science inclined public, I maintain, is both the largest and the most overlooked group of European Open Science Cloud stakeholders. Um, uh, I, there we go. So I've got a, a one uh, a commendable um, uh, um, uh, example where this has not happened, and the citizens have been um, recognised in this this image of the um, uh, uh, EOSC uh, stakeholders, and the citizens are there. But even this commendable example uh, doesn't capture the size of the community, and. Uh, I'll give you an example of this. This is one of our um, escape citizen science projects, the Galaxy Zoo Clump Scout. Uh, we're asking volunteers to look for uh, the birth of stars and galaxies. And I just want to highlight for you the number of volunteers here on the left is uh, nearly 14,000 volunteers, but the science team is just three academics. So you can see just the, uh, 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 the disparity here in the, in the volume of people who are engaging with open science and the volume of science academics who, uh, uh, who are also doing this. There's, um, there's a much, much bigger community of the science inclined public. So uh, also in this project, we have built in training into, uh, into the project so people can learn about what uh, they are analyzing. And uh, for example, here, we've got a description of what the clumps are in the galaxies. Um, so this is a way for the uh, volunteers to gain some scientific context about this data. Uh, and I would maintain that this is the only way to have two-way engagement and training of a huge orders of magnitude more uh, users of the op European Open Science Cloud uh, quickly. Uh, my third provocative statement is that citizen science is not outreach. And I, I, I realize I may be preaching to the converted here, uh, uh, but I think it's a very important message to get across because people often put a pejorative just outreach on citizen science. Uh, in fact, citizen science, in my view, is, is it's a tool for doing science. It's like a a spectrometer or an accelerator beamline or something. It is, it is a biological computer 
to do science for you. Um, and here I'm using citizen science in a slightly different sense to Janice. For Janice, it is a data collection, um, direct data collection. But for me, citizen science is it's more in the context of data analysis, data mining, um, data classification. And, and there you're, you're using volunteers' brains to do your science for you. And uh, in view of that, we have started the integration of the Zooniverse science Zooniverse platform with the Escape Science Analysis platform. So it is already possible to download your Zooniverse data into the Escape Science Analysis platform. And our aspiration is that uh, you would manage your citizen science project throughout its life cycle from within the European Open Science Cloud. So, um, uh, and, and this isn't the only engagement with the Uni European Open Science Cloud because volunteers are already going from citizen science projects, so for example, Galaxy Zoo in this case, to professional tools. And this particular professional tool, uh, part of its back end is virtual observatory, um, although it's not uh, uh, explicitly part of the European Open Science Cloud at this point, but I mean, that is the aspiration. So going back to this landscape of services, we have professional scientists using the science platforms to analyze citizen science data and even manage citizen science projects uh, aspirationally and then the citizen scientists jumping out into other parts of the uh, uh, the European open science cloud ecosystem so that's our vision for citizen science in, uh, in the European open science cloud so my provocative statements in summary making data fair is easy compared to making fair data useful people need the context of of, uh, of the data otherwise they will make mistakes uh, also, the, the science inclined public is the largest and most overlooked group of EOSC stakeholders, and that citizen science is not outreach. I mean, it can help with outreach, um, but that's not fundamentally what it's for. It's there for, for, for answering scientific or social scientific questions. And so this is my uh, uh, schematic for how uh, I see the experts and the, and the public engaging with the European Open Science Cloud, the experts leading the way, but bringing the scientists with them and, and helping them with their engagement. And I'll finish up with a final provocative statement that may or may not be uh, obvious uh, or, or contentious to you, that no single European Open Science Cloud interface will suit everybody because the needs of the different communities, the needs of the different stakeholders are so different that no one interface will suit everybody. And that's everything I wanted to say. That's great, thanks, Stephen. So there are currently no questions uh, for you on the chat. Okay. Um, and given, given the time, I, I, if you're in agreement, I would suggest that we end the, the presentation section here. Excellent. And we move I... on to the, the discussion section. Uh, so I pass the chair to you. Right. Then... Okay. So just to be clear, I think we finish in 15 minutes. Is that correct? Yeah. Right. So um, I'd like to start with uh, a, a question to the, uh, the assembled wise crowd here. Um, uh, and that's uh, how much do volunteers actually learn about science in, um, uh, uh, in participating in citizen science. Um, and uh, I mean, the way, what, where I'm coming from with that is that um, we have found in our various citizen science projects that we can create these beautiful educational tools and beautiful uh, introductions for, for how people should work with the data but they don't use them they really don't they just dive straight in and they start doing stuff so uh so we have some mixed results for <laughs> for uh uh how well people are uh, are engaging with the learning resources so i i'm generally in interested to know how well do um uh how much do people actually learn so maggie you've got your hand up please yeah uh, i haven't uh, set up or operated a citizens uh, science uh, project, but I have interacted with citizens in, in uh, various uh, scientific contexts. And I think my main problem is that they do not in general, general understand the scientific process 
so to speak. Uh, that they are maybe interested in some technical aspects or they, they watched a, a fancy documentary about astronomy or something on, on TV and now they want to get involved because it looks so great and colorful and, and it's so interesting or whatever. But they don't really get this idea about how scientists work, the, how you investigate, the, how you create a hypothesis, how you work with that, etc. So I, I was wondering, is that also one a part of your um, how well do people understand science question or were you more concerned with with uh, sort of the, the research questions? Well, that's a really interesting point. Um, I was thinking in particular, well, I came to this thinking uh, just the, um, the, the science questions themselves, but you're right also that there is a, a lot of lack of understanding of just what scientists do and how they formulate questions. And um, yeah, so Hugh, I can see you've got your hand up. Yeah, hi Stephen. Um, yeah, obviously we work on the same project, so you're definitely right that the very often the the stuff that's built into the project, so the text tutorials and and for example the real time feedback and stuff like that, that has less impact on what the citizens are actually learning about the science. What has a far greater impact, certainly in the context of Zooniverse is if the researchers actually engage in the forums that are associated with the projects. So Zooniverse has this platform called Talk, which is for uh, a set of fora. And if the researchers take the time and make the effort to engage with, with volunteers there, they can provide exactly the information that the volunteers are looking for, guide the way that they're interacting with the data and doing the science. Um, and in doing that, what actually tends to happen in the really successful projects is you end up with large communities of volunteers who have upskilled themselves, perhaps with a little um, initial intervention from the researchers, and then they're able to guide new volunteers who come and join the project. I mean, Galaxy Zoo is a classic, classic example of that, where there's a really big community of really quite expert volunteers now who even write their own papers and things like this, um, and they, they really keep, keep the whole thing going with minimal intervention from the quote unquote professional scientists. So I just thought I'd point that out. Mm. Yeah, so just actual in get tutorial, even online tutorial type interaction, much more effective than just giving people stuff to read and engaging directly with the volunteers. Oh. Janice, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to add to the discussion the approach that we took, we have taken with iSpot, where learning was a key part of the design of the platform. Mm. And therefore, it happens through the community interaction. And as you, the more you use the site, the more you demonstrate also how you're learning and how you're developing. So that happens to a, a what we call a reputation system, where you build um, you build up points on the various different um, observations that you add in. So, for example, you can see your growth from one different um, one different species group to another. We did some very early analysis of iSpot. As I said, it's been running now for over 12 years, as you know, Stephen. And what, what, we, what we found in the early years was that um, after somebody posted their 50th observation, they were able to self-identify themselves without the help of the community. Mm -hmm. um, so that was some early analysis we did. Um, we, we're doing further analysis as we do things more now. For example, we're analyzing the use of integrated quizzes, for example, and, and how people use that to build their learning. And so there are various approaches you can do, but I think it sort of happens a lot from the design. You make sure that if you want learning to be a key part of it, think about it from the very beginning and integrate it so it's not an add-on. That's, that's, you know, my two cents on that. Mm. So there was a question in the chat here. Uh, do you see difference in the differences in the level of engagement of the citizens with respect to gender, age, city versus rural, etc.? Well, we don't actually collect um, that information. When we started iSpot, we decided that we didn't want, because that was 12 years ago is a long time when it comes to technology. And at that time, we didn't want that to be a deterrent for people participating. Right. So what, we, what we're doing now, we're doing more analysis through what people are saying on the site, how they've been talking, what they've been doing, to see what we can garner from that to understand the user groups more. 
Okay. So the the the, uh, the increasing skill of your volunteers and how, as as they learn more, it's actually built into the design of your experiment. Um, but fifty is a lot, so it takes a you need some very engaged volunteers to to do that. Um, I guess you have a core of uh, very engaged people who are who are doing your we stuff. Do. We do, and it varies. I mean, we have some more engaged than others. We have our usual ones who we know are always there. So anything we're doing. So for example, right now, we're doing some work on the platform, um, various infrastructure updates, and we get core groups to help us with the testing and to make sure it's all working. And they're really keen and excited to join in and do things like that. So we try to integrate and involve them as much as possible. And, and you have forums that are already- uh, Yes, we have forums built into, into the system as well. So that's that's clearly a, a, an important lesson yeah. for, for how to, to to get people to uh, to, to learn. Um, I guess this is going to be an interesting thing for for reinforce, where there are some um, uh, really interesting but also quite technical workflows that need to uh, to be worked through. Um, uh, uh, so Hugh, you have your hand up. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to comment on on yeah. the question that was asked before, but in the context of Zooniverse, and I was desperately trying to look up a paper, but I couldn't find it quickly enough. So I'll just say what's in it. Um, it really depends on the type of project, um, the demographics of the people who engage with it. Um, there have there have been some limited studies, um, and then there was also one project called Muon Hunter, um, which was not an escape project, but a, a predecessor to an escape project. Um, and they did a lot of stuff with social media. So they collected that data. And it turns out, I mean, broad brush, that the astrophysics, particle physics, um, I'm going to call it hard sciencey type stuff, that tends to be predominantly done by, by men um, and indeed older men. Um, whereas things like biosciences, social sciences, there's much more representation from younger people and also, and also women as well. So I, th I, I know that one of the, the goals of Zooniverse is to try and somehow flatten that playing field, but it's a very difficult thing to do. And I, I guess it probably reflects societal um, perceptions of, you know, who should be doing astronomy versus who should be doing uh, Shakespeare. I don't know. Mm. Mm. Um, Beatrice, you also have your hand up. Yes, uh, I just want to share an experience we had uh, this year during the pandemic <laughs> uh, was with the Frontiers project, also an uh, European project, and it's about the virtual visits to the to different installation and observatories. One of the the visits were to the to the CERN, the Large uh, Hadronic Collider, I think to EGO and also to Piero Shea Observatory here in South America, in Argentina. And it uh, was an amazing experience because uh, we made, of course, a set of surveys post-visit. And uh, all the people asked to be engaged about the project. And the question al along the visit, which uh, present all the installation, even the forbidden parts, it, it means the, the workshops and laboratories and data databases and, well, was amazing thing where a lot of people, but um, the most important thing was the engagement and the, and the demand of more experience like this. And what else now, what else? We want to continue with this idea to study the cosmic rays or the particles. And this was an amazing experience. We made two virtual visits for Europe and three for Latin America in the same way here in Pierre Roche Observatory. And the number of visitors were the number we receive in the face-to-face -face visits along a year for each day. So it was um, a, a, a great experience. Now, for example, Pierre Roche Observatory has a set of uh, public data and our data to make science. So we need citizen scientists. And uh, this kind of uh, approach to people who cannot travel, for example, is perfect. It's very good. It will be an open window to the future. <laughs> so, so do you think that these sorts of virtual visits might also help the citizen science volunteers for learning yeah. about 
the science, right? Yes, because you transmit uh, what really you do in the observatory and you describe the detectors and you describe the uh, object of study, you describe the particles, you describe the theory, not, not deeply, but you describe some part of the theory, theory better than in a face-to-face -face visit where the visitors go to the, to the visitor center, for example. Yeah. There is a guide, but they are not scientists explaining the things. But in the virtual visits, you have engineers and scientists, people who produce the science and obtain results. So the, the change in the approach to the visit to the observatory is, is very good to mm. future plans in citizen mm -hmm. science. Okay. So again, it is a direct engagement with the scientific yeah. professional community. Uh, the, yes, the, and to show the, to show you device, you 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 instruments and the observatory and the institute. That is very important for the people, not only to read the book. Do, do you have evidence yet for people going from these virtual visits and then becoming more engaged in citizen science? Well, or? some people, yeah, some people in frontiers has a very well uh, um, uh, shaped uh, results from the virtual visits. So yes, we can share this. Uh, this information i think well manolis is not here but we can we can ask for the for the social socialization of the of the mm. information yes of course it's indeed that's very important so in our 15 minutes we've we've sort of covered um uh what some things that don't work and some things that do work in um improving the sort of the, the scientific capital improving uh, volunteers knowledge about the subject Throwing education at them hasn't worked, but um, engaging with them directly in forums and in virtual visits, that does work. Um, but it's also quite specific to the project as well, and it's good to design things into the project. Um, as, as sort of build in the, the, the increase of uh, people's uh, uh, scientific knowledge you know, into the design of the project. So with that, um, we are now at... Uh, I think it's 1800 hours uh, Euro Central European time, summer time. Um, so we're kind of running out of time. We have an aspiration to, to, to try and capture some of this material in a, an open access uh, short publication somewhere. Um, uh, I've been taking some notes in the Google chat, uh, the Google Doc, um, but I've stopped doing that while I was chairing this chat session. Um, please dive in and put your views into there. And I don't know if anybody else has any um, any notes that have taken in real time that could could be added in. Uh, if people have, then please do add those in. And um, one aspiration is to, to to put this into the research notes of the AAS, which is uh, it's very short format, um, but then that's also easier to write and uh, and it's open at gold open access and it's free as well. So we could we could do that or. Uh, if you have any other suggestions for where we could put this, uh, 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 publish any brief conclusions from today, um, th then put it, in fact, in the Google Doc. That would be a really useful place for it. And indeed, uh, I do hope someone will save the chat. Will <laughs> Somebody quick, copy and paste now. And so, uh, uh, Irina... Oh, there is. I'll also save the chat and share uh, with the organizers. That's absolutely fabulous. And with that, I think I should uh, thank everybody for turning up and hand back to uh, Irina. Oh, thank you so much. Um, it was um, very, very useful. Um, and I hope uh, we'll continue those conversations. Uh, thank huh. you so much. And you. Have a nice evening. Ciao, ciao. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.